Um, for those of you that don't know me, my name's Brad Clausen. I've attended this church for a while, and I guess I'm in the row of replacement preachers. Uh, it's always a pleasure to preach and to share from the Word of God. Uh, when they, uh, they had to do a bunch of painting here this week, and they had to readjust the cameras, and they said, well, the camera might just be uh, pointing at my knees. I said, that's fine to just be showing them knocking together as I... Um, would you pray with me? Father, we thank you for this morning. We thank you for uh, just how good you are. We thank you that we come together and worship you in song and communion and, um, and just the preaching of your word. And just we pray, God, that as this morning that you would just convict us and, uh, and encourage us as we hear from this psalm. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Today we continue in our Summer of Psalms series, and we come to Psalm 24. It's the fifth psalm in our series, so if you have your, gra- if you have your Bibles, uh, grab them out and um, turn to Psalm 24 as I read from it. The earth is the Lord's, and the fullness thereof, the world and those who dwell therein. For he has founded it upon the seas, and established it upon the rivers. Who shall ascend the hill of the Lord? Who shall stand in his holy place? He who has clean hands and a pure heart who does not lift up his soul to what is false and does not swear deceitfully. He will receive blessing from the Lord and righteousness from the God of his salvation. Such is the generation of those who seek him, who seek the face of the God of Jacob. Lift up your heads, O gates. Be lifted up, O ancient doors. And the king of glory may come in. Who is this king of glory? The Lord, strong and mighty. The Lord, mighty in battle. Lift up your gates, lift up your heads, O gates. Lift them up, O ancient doors. That the king of glory may come in. Who is this king of glory? The Lord of hosts. He is the king of glory. The reading of God's word. Just a little bit of background information on this psalm. It is believed by many that the scholars that this psalm was written as a celebration to the Ark of the Covenant being brought into Jerusalem in 2 Samuel chapter 6. I would encourage you to read that. It's quite long. Um, However, no one knows for sure, but this explanation seems to fit best. So we take a psalm like this and it's nice, and how do, we apply the, how do we apply it? What does it have for us today? We will break it up into three sections. The first section are verses 1 and 2. The earth is the Lord's, and the fullness thereof. The world and those who dwell therein. For he has founded it upon the seas and established it upon the rivers. Here we have a definitive and confident statement from the psalmist that God is the sole creator and owner, not just of the world, but also everything in it. David didn't stop at acknowledging that the form of the earth was God's, but that every little thing belongs to him. In a time where Assyria and Egypt's kingdoms were greater, no one could have suggested that their, or one could have suggested that their gods were greater as well. To the best of our knowledge, David had never ventured more than a few hundred miles beyond Israel and never seen a large sea 
other than the Mediterranean and perhaps the Red Sea. David never saw a modern globe or earth projection, yet he knew the waters dominated the globe so much, so much that it could be said that the earth is in the midst of the waters instead of the waters in the midst of the of the waters in the midst of earth's land. The reality of the fact that God is over all is found in a number of other scriptures. Here are a few of those references. First one, Psalm 50, verses 10 to 12. The psalmist says, For every beast of the forest is mine, the cattle on a thousand hills. I know all the birds of the hills and all that moves in the field is mine. If I were hungry, I would not tell you, for the world, its fullness are mine. Psalm 89, 11. The psalmist praises God and says, The heavens are yours, the earth also is yours, the world and all that is in it, you have founded it. When uh, Paul addresses the Corinthians at the end of chapter 10 as to their concerns and what they should eat and shouldn't eat, he just says, eat it. And verse 26 of chapter 10, Paul says, For the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. On a side note, the image of that verse could make a person a bit squeamish. The picture in mind is the picture I get in my mind is going to some international food market and being offered a bunch of food that I have never seen before, just eating it, no questions asked. That could be a touch dicey. Colossians chapter 1, 15 to 19 says this, He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. For by him all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things were created through him and for him. And he is before all things. And in him all things hold together. And he is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that he is pre everything he might preeminent, be preeminent. For in him all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell. Here we have a picture that through Jesus everything is held together. To close off this section, here's a quote from Charles Spurgeon. The fullness of the earth may mean its harvest, its wealth, its life, or its worship. In all these senses, the Most High God is possessor of all. The earth is full of God. He made it full and keeps it full. I'll repeat that. The fullness of the earth may mean its harvest, its wealth, Life worth worship in all these senses, the Most High God is possessor of all. The earth is full of God, He made it full, and He keeps it full. The second section of this passage goes from verses 3 to 6. It says, This Who shall ascend the hill of the Lord? Who shall stand in His holy place? He who has clean hands and a pure heart, who does not lift up his soul to what is false and does not swear deceitfully, he will receive a blessing from the Lord and a righteousness from the God of his salvation. Such is the generation of those who seek him, who seek the face of the God of Jacob. In the light of the first two verses that state that God is over all, David asks a genuine and fair question that you and I would also ask. Who am I then? Who can ascend the hill of the Lord? Is it even possible to do this? 
David answers the question by giving three qualities. First, he says, someone who has clean hands and a pure heart. David has already established that God rules the earth, and now he declares that God rules the earth on a moral foundation. He is concerned with the moral behavior of mankind. Clean hands are important for good hygiene. But this speaks of a much more than just the washing of water. This term, clean hands, are directly connected to a pure heart. It gives imagery of what our hands are doing is directly connected to where our heart posture is at. We see this theme of a pure heart in other places in Scripture as well. Often our cars, or not our cars, often our lives can look like a car. (laughs) We drive it through the touchless car wash. We pick the most expensive wash we can find, like maybe the thunder wash, knowing full well that it's no better than any other one. Once the car is super shiny, it looks great, and the car looks like it's worth $100,000. Mind you, nowadays it doesn't take much to get to that number. However, you drive down to Walmart and you open it up and everything falls out. Hopefully not the kids. All the garbage falls out. And then you're chasing it around the parking lot trying to clean it up. When Jesus was giving the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew 5, verse 8, he says, Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Deuteronomy 10, verse 12. And now Israel, what does the Lord your God require of you? But to fear the Lord your God, to walk in all his ways, to love him, to serve the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul. Micah 6, verse 8 says, He has told you, O man, What is good? And what does the Lord require of you but to do justice, to love kindness, and to walk humbly with your God? The second quality he gives is someone who doesn't lift his soul up to what is false. What does something false look like? A false declaration, a fraudulent statement, a slander, a lie. These might be normal practices of non-believers, but this is not a reflection of, of those that are in Christ. One commentator asked the question, how could they have fellowship with the God of truth if they do not hate every false way? It gives us a picture of the importance of what we are lifting our soul up to. At the very core of us, what do we worship? The third quality he gives is someone who does not swear deceitfully. Jesus gives us a picture and a strong warning when he addresses the Pharisees regarding deception in Matthew 12, verses 33 to 36. It says, either make the tree good and its fruit good, or make the tree bad and its fruit bad. For the tree is known by its fruit. You brood of vipers, how can you speak good when you are evil? For out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. The good person, out of his good treasure, brings forth good. And the evil person, out of his evil treasure, brings forth evil. I tell you, on the day of judgment, People will give account for every careless word they speak. For by your words you will be justified, and by your words you will be condemned. David understood all this under the general principles of the Old Covenant in which God promised to bless and receive an obedient Israel and, almost, and also promised to curse and afflict a disobedient Israel. This can be read about in Deuteronomy chapter 27 and 28. 
outside of the terms of the old covenant that God made with Israel, these answers that David gave in verse 4 could cause us great despair. You probably, you and like me, look at those responses and say, I am doomed. There is absolutely no hope for me. My heart is not always pure. Sometimes it's downright wicked. Idolatry can be a stubborn thorn in the heart. And there seems to be things that I am constantly worshiping more than God. Each one of us knows what they are in our lives. We know what they are. Money, relevance, fame. There's many. And probably more than we would like to admit, we tend to make promises and agreements that have a tinge of deceit in them. And it's not looking good for us. But good news. God established a new and better covenant through the person and work of Jesus. Under the new covenant, we see that Jesus is the one who has clean hands and a pure heart. He has never worshipped an idol or said anything deceitful. In his righteousness, given to all who believe, we can ascend his holy hill and stand in his holy place. Romans 3, 22 to 24 says this, The righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ for all who believe. For there is no distinction. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God and are justified by his grace as a gift through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. Charles Spurgeon put it this way, Our Lord Jesus Christ could could ascend into the hill of the Lord because his hands were clean and his heart was pure. And if we by faith in him are conformed to his image, we shall enter too. It's important to reflect on the fact that our works don't get us into heaven. However, however, how we live is a direct reflection on who we worship. 1 John 1 verse 6 says, If we say we have fellowship with him while we walk in darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. Verse 5 describes the rewards for those that have clean hands and a pure heart. The topic of rewards can be a can of worms, but we do know that when we are doing what the Lord says and living our lives according to his will, God has promised to bless us. This doesn't state he will do everything we want or desire, but we do realize that when we ask according to his will, we will receive many things. I think when it comes to blessings from God, often I wonder if we only think of the big things, such as luxurious vacations, fancy homes, big bank accounts, etc. We often overlook the smaller things, like how God is taking care of us, providing for our needs, eliminating our need for worry and anxiety, and strengthening our souls, among many more. They may seem small, but they are great blessings. Verse 6 of Psalm 24 tells us that these are the qualities of those that seek him, who seek the face of God. It gives an imagery of a very intense relationship. The picture of this comes to my mind is if I call someone who, let's say, they live in Vancouver, and they don't answer their phone, but I desperately need to talk to them. Then I text them and they don't respond. But yet I'm so desperate to speak to them that I get in my vehicle and I drive all night in an intense storm all the way there just to speak to them. This is how we are to seek God with this type of intensity. Be it through prayer, the reading of his word, obedience and living on mission for him. 
Psalm 105, verses 3 to 4, encourages us to seek God. It says this, Glory in his holy name, that the hearts of those that seek the Lord rejoice. Seek the Lord and his strength. Seek his presence continually. Now we go to the last section. David writes in verses 7 to 10. Lift up your heads, O gates, and be lifted up, O ancient doors, that the King of glory may come in. Who is this King of glory? The Lord, strong and mighty. The Lord, mighty in battle. Lift up your heads, O gates, and lift them, O ancient doors, that the King of glory may come in. Who is this? The Lord of hosts. He is the King of glory. The first section of Psalm 24 declares the greatness of God. The second section speaks of how man can come into relationship with God. And now the third section seems to be written in song form, like the Song of Solomon, and it seems to welcome God unto his people by the opening of the gates. In verse 7, we see the command is given, open up the gates, that the king of glory may come in. The gatekeeper asked for identification and asked, who is this king of glory? The response in verse 8 is that of the Lord, strong and mighty, the Lord mighty in battle. And for emphasis, the request is repeated, and the answer is the same, identifying that it is the Lord. As I mentioned at the beginning of the sermon, we can assume that, and to the best of our knowledge, this psalm was written either for the arrival of the ark into Jerusalem or the commemoration of it. However, we can also see that it re represents greater things. In my research, I read ancient rabbinical sources tell us that in Jewish liturgy, Psalm 24 was always used in worship on the first day of the week. The first day of the week is our Sunday. So putting these facts together, we can assume that these words were being recited by the temple priests at the very time the Lord Jesus Christ mounted on a donkey and rode into Jerusalem as what we know as Palm Sunday. Let your mind go to the scene in Jerusalem about 2,000 years ago and listen as I read from Mark 11, 1 to 11. Now when they drew near to Jerusalem to Bethpage and Bethany at the Mount of Olives, Jesus sent two of his disciples and said to them, Go into the village in front of you. And, immediate, and immediately as you enter it, you will find a colt tied on which no one has ever sat. Untie it and bring it. If anyone says to you, why are you doing this? Say, the Lord has need of it. And we'll send it back here immediately. They went away and found a colt tied at a door outside on the street and they untied it. And some of those standing there said to them, what are you doing? Untying the colt. And they told them what Jesus had said and they let them go. And they brought the colt to Jesus and they threw their cloaks on it and he sat on it. And many spread their cloaks on the road, and others spread leafy branches that they had cut from the fields. And those who went before and those who followed were shouting, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the coming kingdom of our father David, Hosanna in the highest. And he entered Jerusalem and went into the temple. And when he had looked around at everything, as was already late, he went to Bethany with the twelve. Thousands of people have descended on Jerusalem for the Passover. They are present for what would be the opening ceremonies. And the King of Kings comes riding on a donkey. They shout praises and they celebrate him as he enters the city. And at the same time, the temple priests are chanting this psalm, Psalm 24, that David wrote long ago. 
We know that from history this welcome was short. So many of these people present did not have clean hands and a pure heart. And they crucified Jesus only a few short days later. The end of the psalm is welcoming God unto his people. The fact that when God is welcomed in with open gates and doors, he is pleased to come in. Revelation 3.20 says, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in to him and eat with him, and he with me. As I close this message, Jesus has already ascended the hill. Jesus, the one who owns it all, he ascended the hill and was crucified for our sins and rose from the dead to defeat sin and death so that when we put our faith and trust in him, we may stand before God with clean hands and a pure heart. Have you invited him in and responded to the invitation? Let's pray. Father, we thank you for the work you did, for what Jesus did for us on the cross. We are so thankful that we can live in a right relationship with you. And as we go from here, Lord, we pray that we would reflect you well. And that through how we do our day-to-day life, those on the outside, would, those who are not in, in, who are not of the family yet would say there is something different there. They reflect something else other than this mess that we are living in. We thank you for this time this morning. I pray for each one as we go from here. In Jesus' name I pray, amen.